after that video, I know our next uh, guest needs no introduction, um, but I wanted to try to give everyone a view of the Jill Biden that I know. So we all know what we read about her, um, what we hear about her. We know she was the second lady of the United States from 2009 to 2017. We know she's dedicated her life to being an educator and has over 30 years of experience in teaching and has a goal to make community college accessible to every American and actually to maybe even make it a right of every American. We know that she has a passion for our armed forces and works tirelessly to ensure there is support and resources for military families. And we know that she launched the and is co-chair of the Biden Foundation with her husband, Joe. We know all of that, but let me share with you some of the things that you might not know. I'm privileged to call Jill my mother-in-law, and because of this, I get to see her in a way few people do. I get to see her when no one else is around, when no one else is looking, and people always ask me what she really like. So let me tell you. She is a fiercely loyal and passionate wife, mother, grandmother, and friend. She believes in equality for all and has an unbounded desire to improve life for all. Who she is does not change according to who she's in the room with. What you see is really what you get with her. She is so passionate about education, and this is true, I have never been on a family trip or vacation that she doesn't have a stack of papers next to her that she's grading, and she does it truly with a smile. Um, she leads by, an ex by example and has spent her life trying to make this world a better place. The Biden Breast Health, Health Initiative, which she founded back in 1993 after three of her closest friends were diagnosed with breast cancer, is a perfect example of this. She continues her dedication to ending cancer currently as the co-chair of the Biden Cancer Initiative. And I have to tell you, as a board member, she is the driving force behind much of what we do. In short, Dr. Jill Biden is an inspiration, an inspiration to me to be a better physician, to be a better citizen, to be a better person. So please help me welcome Dr. Jill Biden. Wow. Thank you so much. Wow, thanks. Thank you, Howard. Good afternoon and Happy New Year. Gosh, 2019 goes by so, so fast, doesn't it? We spent the holidays with our grandchildren and at one point, you know, I realized like our little kids are no longer little, they're growing up. And it reminded me to always be present. So first, let me wish you uh, the very best for this new year, and may it be your best yet. This festival, my gosh, Howard, this is like pretty incredible. It's one of the most ambitious healthcare events around. And you're really tackling the most challenging issues of our time. Health equity, the digital revolution, mental health, and women's health. All of these topics are critical. But there's one topic that is especially personal for me and for our family, the battle against cancer. I lost my son, Bo, to glioblastoma. It's a brutal disease. It weakens your body. It takes your speech, even your memories. It's persistent. It spreads like finger-like growth so it's very difficult to remove, and radiation is rarely effective. But most of all, it's fast. The average survival time after diagnosis is only 14 months. For most people, think about it, it's one more birthday, one more New Year's Eve kiss, a handful of moments to laugh and love 
and say goodbye. Bonhoeffer, a theologian, once wrote, time is the most precious gift in our possession, for it is the most irrevocable. Of all the things that cancer steals from us, strength, mobility, comfort, memories, time is the cruelest. The days spent in treatment or recovering from surgery, anniversaries and Christmases, long phone conversations and short summer nights, pages and pages of photo albums unfilled. Our time with each other is precious and irrevocable. We can't afford to wait another minute for better solutions, better treatment, better cures. And that's why what you all do, all of you, is so important. You're finding ways to extend lives, to give people hope. You are paving a way to a cancer-free world. So on behalf of the friends, spouses, children, and the parents who battle alongside of our loved ones, thank you. As Bo fought with every ounce of his strength, he asked Joe and me to keep up our official duties and soldier through our days. Only a handful of people knew what we were going through at the time. A lot of us have had to move between worlds like that, haven't we? You can't often know what's behind someone's smile or how much they need your strength. That time was one of the darkest times of my life and one I don't think I could have survived without the support and kindness of friends and family, especially you, Howard. On top of watching our son struggle, we were trying to find our way through a complex and complicated healthcare system and dealing with the unknowns of a rare disease. Howard was our shepherd through it all, helping us understand the procedures and the medical terms. And Howard, you will always have our deep love and gratitude for that, among so many other things. Cancer took more from us than we ever thought to fear. It shattered our hearts, it stole our joy. And we're not alone. Raise your hand if you or someone else you love has had a cancer diagnosis. Wow, looks like everybody in the room. Far too many of us know that terror. How lonely it can be. How helpless you can feel. How desperate you are to stop the clock for just one moment. We're here today because we know what's at stake. Because we want answers because we want to beat this. I believe that together we can. That is the mission of the Biden Cancer Initiative, to end cancer as we know it. And I'd like to tell you more about our vision for that goal. But before I do that, let me go back and tell you a little bit more about where I came from and how I got involved in working in the cancer space. I'm the oldest of five girls in a suburb outside of Philadelphia. And speaking of that, how about that Eagles win last night? <laughs> oh good, we have some Philly fans here. Sorry you people from Chicago. But uh, it was a great game for any of you who watched it. I know some of you got in yesterday or before, and so, you know, I flew in and I got right off the airplane and ran to the television set because I knew the Eagles were on. 
But uh, it was a great, exciting win. Anyway, um, as a teenager, you can still see I'm excited about it. As a teenager, I spent my summers watching the Phillies on my black and white Philco TV and waitressing at the Jersey Shore to save money for college. From a young age, I knew that I wanted two things. A marriage like my parents, strong and loving and full of laughter, and I wanted a career. So I enrolled at the University of Delaware, but my path turned out to be a bit meandering. One day when I was a senior, I was asked out on a date from out of the blue. It was the 70s, Vietnam, love beads, equal rights. I wore my hair down to the middle of my waist, and so did most of the men I dated. <laughs> so as you can guess, when a handsome, clean-cut, young senator showed up at my door, I took one look at his perfect suit and his leather loafers, and I thought, it's only one date. <laughs> well, one date eventually turned into a marriage proposal. Okay, in truth, it was five proposals. After all, I was only 25 years old, and this was not part of my plan. Eventually, I realized that I was no match for his charm, and I said yes. It might sound strange, but since Joe commuted from Delaware to DC every day, politics was just one part of the equation. He had a job to do, and so did I. I was a full-time teacher. I was raising our three kids and pursuing my education as well. It was a challenge at times, but there was nothing I was willing to give up. Teaching really isn't what I do. It's who I am. As a passion and a skill, it's a pole star that I can always count on to steer me straight, and not just in the classroom. I was in my early 40s when a close friend of mine named Winnie was diagnosed with breast cancer. She was a mom, and her three kids were teenagers who were not much younger than mine. Soon after, another friend confided in me that she had breast cancer as well. Then another, then another. In one year, I watched four of my friends face down that same deadly disease. Three of them survived, but Winnie didn't. Her death motivated me to get more involved in this cause. Heck, I wasn't a medical doctor. I wasn't a scientist. But I felt like I couldn't just stand by and do nothing. I wanted to combat the fear and the silence that kept, kept women in the dark about their health. So I turned to what I knew best, teaching. And I started, started the Biden Breast Health Initiative. We focused on education and put together a program to talk to girls in high schools about self-examinations and prevention. And over the next few years, we visited almost every single high school in the state of Delaware. That experience showed me that I didn't need permission to make change. We all have strengths that we can share. There will, be, there will always be a need for our passions and our talents. And I had to remember that opportunity, the responsibility to use my gifts where I could in January of 2017 as well. We were so proud when President Obama asked Joe to take mission control of the White House cancer moonshot. After the administration ended, 
Many of the leaders we worked with through the moonshot kept coming up to us and saying the same thing. There are incredible organizations in this space. They are doing good work, life-saving work, but there needs to be someone to bridge the gaps between them. Cancer experts, friends, and colleagues convinced us that we were the ones who could convene, find collaborations, and bring people together. So we felt a moral imperative to step up and be useful where we could. From the Biden Breast Health Initiative, to the White House moonshot, to the Biden Cancer Initiative, I've been working in the cancer space for, gosh, I think almost over 25 years now. And a lot has changed in that time. Over the years, there's been an enormous effort to raise awareness and improve health care. In fact, according to the American Cancer Society, the cancer death rate has fallen 26% since its height in 1991. Yet, as you all know, progress is uneven. Rural, black, Latino, and Native American communities all see far less positive cancer outcomes. Poverty draws a line between surviving and succumbing to this disease. Cancer is the second most common cause of death for children up to the age of 14. Cancer rates for this age group actually have actually increased over the years. Earlier today, this morning, I visited the Women's Cancer Resource Center here in Berkeley, which is, what, like a half an hour away. And I met with a group of survivors and navigators and social workers. And I learned something really interesting. I learned this really interesting perspective that, you know, if we have cancer, if one of us or our family members have cancer, we wake up every morning and that's the first thing on our minds, like, oh my God, I have cancer. What, how can I eat healthy? How can, what can I do? You know, what, What's out there? What trials? You know, we have all this access. But for the women at this center, that cancer is like the third or the fourth thing on their list. They wake up every morning and they think, oh my gosh, how am I going to feed my family today? How am I going to have, you know, food on the table? They confront racism. You know, we don't realize the financial toxicity of it all. And, you know, they, a lot of times, they have to skip their treatments because they've got to go to work. You and I, we put our treatments first. That's the first thing that we do. But, you know, the women there at the center told me, you know, we don't go, we don't go to doctors, we don't go to centers because of the fear the fear of finding out about the, what they have, what it's going to mean. And something else you and I may not think about, mistrust of the medical community. I mean, heck, most of us put our doctors on these pedestals. And, you know, think of the Henrietta Lacks story. I mean, that's something that never really occurred to me. But this is what came up in the meeting with these women at the center. And I think, you know, we have to remember that this disease is about people. And what I found most, what I came away feeling after talking to the survivors and to the women there, that they really did have a sense of hope, that they were going to try to make things better for the women in these underserved communities. They were gonna to try to do a much better job at getting out the message that there is help out there. So while earlier diagnosis, precision medicine and immunotherapy 
have revolutionized the treatment of certain diseases. Many cancers remain as deadly as ever, like pancreatic and like what our son had, brain cancer. And though improvements in diagnosis and treatments may change the statistics, individuals still struggle to understand and cope with the complicated medical environment. Patients and their families, and many of you I bet have, even though you're here and you know a lot about medicine, they still feel overwhelmed by medical jargon and treatment options. They feel alone and confused by the complexity of the very healthcare system that is there to support their journey. Not everyone is lucky enough to have a doctor in the family like we had with Howard. All of this is not for lack of trying. There are wonderful organizations out there doing great, incredible work in this area. But the gap still exists between scientists, patients, advocates, and nonprofits that it's just untenable. Despite decades of research, billions in funding, and the best minds still working on this issue, there still is no word as frightening as malignant. It doesn't have to be this way. That is the guiding principle of our work at the Biden Cancer Initiative. We're bridging the gaps in the cancer network. We're bridging, we're working to provide resources, improved outcomes, and just as importantly, offer hope. Last fall, we formed the Biden Cancer Collaborative, a platform bringing together patient and advocacy organizations to develop patient-focused solutions. And the lessons we've learned have been surprising. For example, it may not be obvious what the sharing economy has to do with cancer. But organizations like Airbnb, WeWork, and Lyft have all enthusiastically found ways to join our mission. Airbnb expanded its open homes platforms to include medical stays. Pretty incredible stuff. WeWork has added new collaboration hubs. Lyft has expanded its ride-share services at no cost. So far, 57 new commitments have been made from the public and private sector. These innovative programs and partnerships focus on data sharing, patient support, education and empowerment, research, clinical trials, access to care, disparities, and prevention and early detection. From research to treatment to support, all of the improvements we are capable of making only matter if we improve lives. And that's where we need your help. Right now, if we stopped research entirely, if we never spent another dime on finding new cures, we could still save thousands of lives by doing one thing, breaking down the barriers that exist between the various branches of this movement and sharing the knowledge that already exists. And no one knows more about breaking down barriers and disrupting outdated models than all of you. Everyone in this room, in this group, has a role to play. But for this group, that's especially true. We cannot do this without you. So go to your strengths. Help us connect more patients to trials, more researchers to one another, 
more families to, nav to navigation tools that they need. Ask yourself, what can I, what can you, what can I bring to this cause? Because with all of your experience, innovation, and drive, you are our best hope. We can only do this if we all work together. And we have to act now. So as we begin the new year, may we, re may we remember that our time together is precious and irrevocable. That getting this right for patients, for their families, for our entire community, ending the rain, the terror this sickness has held for so, so long, that this is the urgency of now. That together, we are stronger, we are fiercer, and we are more powerful than this disease. Together, we will fight for the most precious thing we all have, time. Thank you. You all know Howard's my son-in-law, right? <laughs> so he better be good when he asks these questions. <laughs> I, I, seriously, you did, I'm not nervous, no, not at all. I have to, so thank you. I mean, you can, you can all imagine how, um, how amazing it must be to, uh, to have such amazing in-laws who are doing such phenomenal, phenomenal um, things to change our world for the better. Um, first off, as you could see from her, from her remarks, huge, huge sports fan. And I'm going to throw Stephen under the bus because most th people would think I have a brother and that's who I text <laughs> about sports with right here. Literally, uh, if there's a game on, I know I'm going to get a text about it. So, um, you, so you mentioned that you, you, you know, one of, one of five and and so, are all the sisters sports fans too, or do you think you're the oh, biggest? Oh yeah, we're all texting with one another. Yeah, you're uh, not the only one, Howard. I, I was going to say, I, I, thought, I, I felt special for yeah. a second, but now, now I'm upset that Kimmy never texted me about it. Well, I'll tell her, because she did text me. That's yeah, my youngest there you sister. Go. So, um, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that you are, uh, and I checked it again this morning, the only first or second lady that has held a full-time job outside of the administration the entire time that you were uh, in the White House. Um, what, what was, first off, um, did you have any pushback from that? And what was it that, that drove you to do that? Well, I like to say, um, you know, I can't live Joe's life entirely. I mean, there are parts of it that I love. But, you know, I have, I have my own career, I have my own love, my own passion, which is teaching. So when we were elected um, and we won, I said to Joe, you know, Joe, I have to keep teaching. I mean, I am not what I would call a lady who lunches. I mean, I, I love teaching. And he said, you know, Jill, you should. So actually, I was in the classroom, uh, I think five days after the 2008 election. And uh, so, and I worked the entire time. And, um, you know, I think it's a lot of people say to me, you know, how did you do this? You were doing the White House, you were doing teaching. And, um, and actually, a student said to me uh, just recently, last semester, she said, Dr. B, you know, can I ask you to help me with something? And I said, sure. I mean, I'm thinking it was commas, you know, thesis statement. And she said, um, how do you do it? Help me to do it, you know, better. And I looked at her, and this is a student, by the way, who was from Afghanistan. She was one of our interpreters 
which for our military, which means she put herself and her family, you know, they were at risk. So none, no one in her community knew that she was helping the US military. And so she got her family to the United States and here she was in my classroom, by the way, pregnant. And um, here she is asking me and I'm thinking, wow, you are one of my heroes and you're asking me, how do I do it all? And the funny thing is, um, the day the research papers were due, I get a text, I don't know, it was like 6.30, 7 in the morning, and she's sending me a text, hey, Dr. B, I'm on my way to the hospital. I can't hand in my research paper today, <laughs> which was so funny. But it just shows the dedication, really, of students who really want an education. And that's what I find in community college students. And that's why I find, you know, that's why I fight so hard to make community college free for, uh, for students. And um, anyway, oh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Absolutely. So when you, you were in the, in the classroom five days after being elected, when you walked into the classroom, were people surprised? Did they recognize oh, you? Oh, my did gosh. They... Yeah. So no. No, they didn't. Because first of all, they didn't expect me to be there. My students are so busy at a community college, they're working, they have kids, they're going to school, they don't have time for TV. Okay, so some did, but you know, they kept quiet. So, not, but not everybody knew. So it was the end of the first semester, it was in the spring, I was doing conferences, and some, one of my students came running in, Dr. B, and I said, yeah, and she said, I saw you last night on the television with Michelle Obama. And I said, yeah, and she said, I yelled to my mom, 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 come here, come here, that's my English teacher. And her mother came in and said, that is not your English teacher, that's the second lady of the United States. So I have to tell you, not everybody knows, not everybody still knows. I mean, you know, to, um, I mean, every semester, their, their heads are somewhere different. And you're thinking to me, okay, or you're thinking, how could they not know? But let me ask you one question. When you were, think back, a freshman in college, who was the second lady? <laughs> yeah, see, you can't, name, you can't name who it was, right? So there you have it. A couple of the entrepreneurs <laughs> are saying you were. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> So you, you also mentioned, which, which uh, always was really near and dear to my heart too, is military families, that mm -hmm. this, this person did military service. Um, you have such a passion for ensuring that military families are taken care of. And can you just share with, with everybody a little bit, while Bo was away, yeah. um, what effect it had on, on Nat and Hunt mm -hmm. and on her family, and just uh, why this is such a near and dear passion for you? Well, my father was uh, military in World War II. He was Navy, he was on a ship. And so I grew up with a sense of patriotism and how important the military was to all of America. And then um, Bo joined up for National Guard and he went away to, um, to Iraq for a year. He was deployed, actually. He was deployed when we won election and he was with his unit, and as we walked out on stage on election night, we took him with us, we Skyped with him and his unit, and we said, hey, Bo, we're going out there, and you're going with us. And um, I have to tell you, when I met, I had met Michelle, because, Michelle Obama, because she was a Senate spouse, as I was. And so the first time we got together, she said, hey, Jill, if we win, what do you want to work on? And I said, I want to work on military families. And she said, so do I. And so that's how, that really, you know, bonded us to one another. And from that moment on, as soon as we were in the office, we traveled the country. Actually, we traveled the world to visit our troops and um, visited with, uh, with our military families, saw their needs, you know, in whether it was healthcare, or what, education, uh, wellness, and we tried to work with military families to make, you know, get their needs met. So um, it's a cause that's near and dear to my heart, and I continue to work with military families. And, uh, and I did see the effect of, 
you know, you may not think about this, but think about the military family members or that you may know that may or may not be in your community. We don't always think about them, but hey, we're still involved in war. So we should be thinking about them and what they're going through because I know how difficult it was for us to, you know, the Christmas comes around and there's the empty seat at the table. Or it's, you know, her, I mean, it was Natalie's birthday, I can remember, and she said, Nana, you know, my daddy's not here. Or the little things, you know, when they lose their first tooth. I mean, the things that matter so much. So as you think about, you know, what you can do, find those military members, you know, who have someone deployed who are in your church or in your schools and, you know, reach out, reach out. You know, hey, you know, a mom might be left alone with three kids and her husband's deployed. And so take over a pizza some Friday night or offer to babysit. I mean, I think it's so important that we don't forget about our military families and the, just how incredible they are and their strength and their resilience. Absolutely. Yeah. And being that uh, we're at a healthcare conference, I also wanted to just bring it back to the Biden Cancer Initiative. The, uh -huh. the things that that uh, you and and the vice president are doing for that are so so important. Um, as you and you mentioned, you um, were at an event this morning, and I know that you travel around the the country and the world, meeting with caretakers, with patients, with physicians, with researchers. And I know I don't want to put you on the spot, but is there anything surprising over the last several years that you've learned or that you've come away with um, in where we are? I know I, 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 I've heard a couple uh, talks where you say that, and, and, and Joe says, we want to get to the system that we think we already have. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, there are so many advances that have been made, like the immunotherapy, but... Um, there's just, like I said in my speech, there's so much more that, you know, needs to be done to bring people together. And um, I don't know, just, I think the thing that surprises me, you know, there's just like today when I was at that um, center, how many people are falling between the cracks? How many people are not getting services because they don't have insurance or they don't know where to go? or they don't know how to find a doctor, or they don't, I mean, you get that diagnosis and then what do you do? What do you do? What's the first thing you do? You don't know. How, what treatment do I need? How am I gonna pay for it? Hey, how am I gonna get there? Where's the, where do I get uh, chemotherapy? Where do I get the radiation? So I think we cannot, we cannot forget about those underserved communities. And they're the ones that I spoke about, the Latino, the Native American, you know, the African American, because their cancer rates are high. And a lot of times we just, I don't know, we just get so wrapped up in our own lives that we don't think about all those people who are struggling from cancer. So I guess that's the one thing that keeps, I have to keep reminding myself like, hey, you know, we're doing a lot, but we cannot forget those communities. Absolutely. And as you said, even in the, in the initial diagnosis when they're thinking, where am I going to get the chemo? Where am I going to get the radiation? How about, as you even mentioned, how am I even going to get there? Who's yeah. going to watch the kids while, yeah. I, yeah. while I do this? And how do yeah. I take off of work when mm -hmm. I'm going to lose the house or we're not going to have a yeah. place or to live? Or I don't live? get paid for the day if I go get chemotherapy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know you have a plane to catch. I going do. Back I have to, to teach tomorrow morning. She has to, literally, <laughs> she has to go. And tr truly, she has papers in the back that she's waiting to grade. So, but, you know, there's, um, I don't often get a chance to publicly um, thank you and really let you know. So, for those of you who don't know, I'm also a practicing physician and I do um, cancer, head and neck cancer reconstruction. And I have to tell you, Daily, daily patients who I'm dealing with um, who have either a diagnosis of cancer, new diagnosis of cancer, or in, are in the fight of cancer, literally 
um, when they find out that, uh, that we're related, just thank me. They say, T tell, tell Jill and Joe I'm fighting. Oh. And they literally um, look to you and, and, and the vice president for um, hope, for strength, for courage, um, for themselves and their family, and they say, T "Tell them, tell them, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fighting," and and thank them for me. So, just publicly, I want to just thank you for also, as Stephen said, one of the C's is continuity, and as you and and the vice president were so gracious to continue the fight that you started in the White House and bring it into the public sector now so we can continue this fight and support you and just love you and thank you so much for being here. Thank you and never give up hope. Never give up hope. Thank you.